Today on The Spirit Contemporary Life. Every truth in the Bible has an ability to stop every fiery dart in that area. I'm so glad you decided to join me today. You've probably heard me talk a lot about the spirit contemporary life, which is about what the Christian life should look like as a believer in today's world. Through this TV program, I wanna show you that the spirit contemporary life can be one filled with love, peace, joy, prosperity, healing, and so much more. In John 10, 10, it says, Jesus came so you could have life and have it to the full. I truly believe that God has a special plan for each and every person watching today. You have a unique gifting, a calling on your life. If you can learn to be fully connected to Holy Spirit, relevant, cool, and contemporary, you can be so effective in impacting others for the kingdom of God. You can experience the spirit and temporary life. So grab a pen and paper or your tablet, iPad, and take some notes on today's message. Today, we're going to talk about what kind of power does the devil have in your life? And uh, can he just come in and destroy you, hurt you? Because the Bible says that's his desire. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. What about our minds? Can he read our minds? What about people that are struggling with so much anxiety and stress today that is just off the charts? They say that literally depression is going to affect 80% of the population at some point in your life. And so all these stats are just showing us a world that is out of control in their mind. Where's the devil in all of this? And does he have a lot of power? If he does, how do we shut him down? Let's dive into this topic, and I believe I can help you totally go to a place of peace and power when it comes to dealing with this topic. All right, John 8, 44. Jesus is talking about the devil, and he says, You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. All right, let's talk about the devil for a minute. And we're not going to go in too deep into every area, but we need to understand his basic flaws and his personality. He is a liar. Now, whenever you meet a really good liar, the reason they are a liar is because they have no good truth. If a person is hugely successful, doesn't need your money, uh, you know, has every, and has all the goods intact, he can just speak truth. But if he doesn't have anything and he's trying to rip you off and sell you something and, and he's not doing well. So this is why liars lie is because they're trying to get something from you that they want, that they need. The devil doesn't have anything. He's a liar. He has no power. Uh, the Bible we're going to find out in a little bit says that he was stripped of all power against you. And I'll show you how that works and what that means. Because a lot of Christianity doesn't have this figured out. Uh, you know, we hear lots of stories like he's, the devil's had his teeth pulled. He's like a roaring lion. And I totally agree. But how did he pull his teeth, etc.? So he's a liar. Now that means that every negative thing that comes into your mind, because see the Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, that we have a shield of faith. And that when a fiery dart comes at us, like an arrow it's talking about, just 
that if you don't have the shield of faith up, it hits you. Ooh, oh, oh. And all of a sudden, the thought, if it carries fear, if it carries um, you know, disgrace, if it carries unhappiness, if it carries lust, if it carries... Every thought the enemy will try to shoot at you, he's trying to sink it deep into you. And so if you don't have, if you're not born again, and you have not built up the shield of faith, which is faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We talked about that. So this faith comes into you, and every time a fiery dart comes, like, okay, this is just God's getting back at you. The shield of faith goes up, bam, and it stops that arrow from hitting you. And the thought that goes with it, that this is God getting you back for your former sins. Now, faith is comes from God's word, and the reason it would stop it is because inside of you would go, no. Jesus has set me free. He took my sin. He took the curse of Allah. That, and that thought is literally the, put out instantly, just doused. The flaming arrow, bam, just doused. Has no ability to get you. But if a person doesn't know and has never been taught or doesn't believe that Jesus took all your sin, then he took all your punishment for your sin, and they've been taught, well, you know, but, 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 buts have a real way of wrecking God's word, then the, the shield of faith can't stop that arrow. It comes whistling right past all of your armor, and it sinks deep into you, and you begin to wrestle with this thought. The enemy can shoot thoughts at your mind. He cannot read your mind. As a believer, we have the mind of Christ. Jesus is within us, but he is a pro at reading people's expressions, micro-expressions. He's watched your habits for years. He know how easy it is to tempt you to food, to sex, to tempt you to anything. He, they, they've, he studied you. The Bible says there are familiar spirits, which is from the root word family, which means they've studied you. And so they know your weaknesses. When an enemy is coming at a, a walled city, he doesn't come at the, at the thickest part of the wall. He doesn't come where the wall's being defended by the greatest warriors. He comes at the wall where there are holes, where it's the weakest part. And the Bible says that your mind is the walls of your spirit. And so what you believe, if it's not true, that's where he will attack you. So according to John 8, 32, you will know the truth. And it's the truth that sets you free from the attack of the enemy. Now, if you don't know the truth, for example, about your past life as a Christian and that you are free from all of the things that would bring, that then what happens is if you don't know that, he'll attack you there continually and you will live a life of living in regret living in condemnation, living in guilt all the time. Everywhere you go, the first thing you're going to think about, I wonder if they know that this was my past. I wonder if they find out if they're going to be my friend. I wonder if God will bless me because of this. So every truth in the Bible has an ability to stop every fiery dart in that area. Do you even know your power? Do you even know your authority? Are there areas you don't know the authority and the power and the principles of God? And the second he finds an area where you don't know, that's the area he attacks. If you believe the truth, Galatians 3.13, that Jesus became a curse for us. And that, so it says that, that Jesus became a curse for us so that we can have the blessings in our lives. Now, if you don't know that and know the truth, when, when thoughts come at you, I'm just feeling a little bit sick, I wonder if it's the symptoms of cancer, you know, and you begin to read all this stuff and you watch TV shows, and his goal is to shoot arrows like thoughts and beliefs at you to see if you'll hang on to it because he has no power to hurt you unless he can turn your believing against you. You see, your believing is very powerful. If you believe that, say you're a, a lady and you've been taught by your parents that or your mom that men are just pigs, they only want one thing, uh, there are no good men out there. Now, if you believe that, it doesn't matter how great a man you marry. 
you will superimpose your beliefs upon him. You will doubt everything he does and see a selfish motive, even if it's not a selfish motive. So the enemy will study you and he will see where your beliefs are wrong. The Bible says the devil is as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom can he devour? Well, what's he looking for? Well, he's looking for beliefs. He's looking to see if you know uh, who you are. Do you even know your power? Do you even know your authority? Are there areas you don't know the authority and the power and the principles of God? And the second he finds an area where you don't know, that's the area he attacks. It's wonderful to know that every negative thought that comes at you, if it's coming from the enemy, uh, he is, he's a liar. So everything's a lie. And he's trying to get you to turn your beliefs against yourself. Now, Colossians chapter 2 yeah, I want to unpack this because this is going to help believers immensely. This shows you kind of what, how and what Jesus did. What did he do that actually destroyed Satan's power in regards to your marriage, your life, your health, your business, your kids, and all of your grandkids, etc. So listen close. It says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, Jesus, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of the decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Okay, let's stop right there. The enemy knows that in the Old Testament, when you sinned, judgment came. The Bible's very clear. For example, if you killed somebody, even by accident, that man's family would go and try to kill you and you would have to run for a city of refuge. And if you could get to the city of refuge, you would be safe there. But an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Even if you didn't mean it, the law was really strong. If you committed a sin, for example, when children were just disobedient and wouldn't listen to their parents, they were to be stoned in the Old Testament and the parents would have to throw the first rocks. So when there was sin, judgment came, bam. And so whenever we, whenever we try to live for God, the enemy would try to bring our sin up against us. And so that we are expecting judgment. We're expecting the curse of the law. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to over 60 verses, it talks about if you obey God's commandments, blessed. If you disobey, curses come on your life. That's Old Testament. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, here it says that Jesus forgave us all our transgressions and has canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. So every law that you broke has an accompanying curse that goes with it, and it's a debt you have to pay. It could be death, it could be sickness, it could be captivity, it could be the curse of the law, it was coming at you and you, it had a right to take you out because you had sinned, you had done something wrong. And so when Jesus died for you and I, he, he died for, he became sin. He took our sin and he took the curse of the law that goes with it. Now, because Jesus was nailed to the cross in our place, all of the debts of you deserve to die, you deserve to be sick, you deserve to be poor, you deserve to have mental illness, you deserve that to lose your marriage, you deserve you deserve all these things because of what you've done. The enemy cannot bring it into your life because Jesus took it. It was nailed to the cross. Well, who was nailed to the cross? Jesus was. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, all your debts for all your sins, all your curses were nailed there for you. Now look what it says next in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and on. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. All right. So what makes the devil have... Ap now, why, when people say, well, you know, that Jesus has stripped the devil of his power. And we'll see plays sometimes where, you know, Jesus is fighting with the devil 
in hell, which I don't think took place because he's not there yet, but he's going to spend eternity there. Uh, I think that uh, the enemy, uh, we'll see him wrestling and throwing him into a lock, and Jesus defeats him, puts his foot on him. Now, all these pictures are very beautiful, so don't get me wrong. But really what took place is that when Jesus took my sin and your sin, okay, now all of those sins were to bring the curse of the law, and he took all of the curse as well. Any time that you've done something wrong and the devil shoots a thought at you and it goes, yeah, when you were an 18-year-old girl, you had an abortion. And uh, because of that, your kids are sick today, years later when you get married. Okay, that's what he'll do. And I've counseled with many people who begin to think that way. And I said, listen, let's go to Colossians chapter 2. You need to know your sin was nailed to the tree. The debt that you have, the curse that had, it did have a right to come into your life. But when you accepted salvation and what Jesus has done for you, then all of the debt that the curse could come in, all of these writs against you, the enemy could stand before us and just go, you know, you're getting this and I have a right to bring it in. He doesn't. Now, if you do things wrong, Satan no longer has any authority to come into your life. Even when you fall into sin, okay, the, the, the curse or the things that happened to you were not brought upon you by God. It is not God that's allowing the curse into your life because Jesus took the curse on the cross. What is happening is the simple law of sowing and reaping. For example, if you walk up to a crowd of men downtown and you just one guy just strikes you the wrong way, so you just punch him right in the face. And all four of them stomp you, break your legs, teeth, jaw, and you're in the hospital for a year. And you think that, God, that that was God getting you. No, that was just a consequence for a dumb action you did. The earth has consequences. Jump off a five-story building. And when you get all crippled or dead, you think, well, why didn't God protect me? You know, is, God allowed me to die. No, 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 no. There are things that go on in this world. That, you know, you can believe all you want for a great marriage, but if you keep screaming at your spouse, okay, it's not going to, it's not going to be a happy time. So what I want you to understand from Colossians 2, and let's read that again now that I've said it. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. All right. I mean, they know. The spirit realm knows everything you've done wrong and the accompanying curse that goes with it. So people who live in the Old Testament and don't understand the cross, oh man, do they live in fear. Because they know that what they've done wrong, that for sure God's going to make sure they think that it's going to come. It's, it's going it's to nail them. But when you recognize, no, Jesus took it. And God delights in forgiveness and mercy. Now someone's with Leon, um, you know, this, this message of grace and mercy and the cross is going to encourage people to sin. No, people are doing a great job of sinning without this message. But the thing is that let's say, let's say that you're right, that someone goes, woohoo, I can go do whatever I want. And God's never going to get me. No, no, God won't, but everybody else will. Keep lying. No one will do business with you. No one will be your friend. No one will stay married to you. Uh, keep committing adultery. No person's going to want to stay married. No one's going to even trust being around you with their spouses. Uh, keep stealing money from people. And again, you'll never get a job. You'll never get a career. You'll wreck your reputation. So all of these sins that we commit have an impact on us in this natural world. But what's beautiful about God's grace is that all of the sins you committed in the past and all the sins you committed in the future, the, the Jesus took them on the cross, died them, and he canceled out this debt. Any power the enemy might have had on you, Jesus took all of the punishment, all of that debt upon himself, and you are now free. You must understand this to render every attack of the enemy null and void. Because in, in Corinthians, in chapter uh, 10, verses 3 to 6, it talks about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And these strongholds are ways you think. They're theories, arguments, is what the Amplified Bible says. So the enemy tries to build into your beliefs 
that he's got a right. I even hear Christians say today, oh, I gave the devil authority to come into my life by doing this sin. What a horrible thing to say. If, if the devil's got authority to walk into your life, he's going to kill what you love. He's going to steal everything you have. He's going to destroy everything he can. The devil does not have a right to come into your life. Now, there are times you might give him opportunity. Like, let's say that you rip off a guy, your neighbor, rip him off really good, and this man who's under demonic influence decides to come at you and come at you and doesn't stop for years and years and years. Well, that's not God, okay? Now, the devil doesn't have a right to come into your life, but you've just given an opportunity. And the Bible does say, don't give the devil opportunities. That is why we must, and God's given us the power to live right. And his power, his grace, his ability is on you. And anything you never could stop in the past, you've got the power to now as you meditate in God's word. You know, this is the area that I have seen incredible victory to Christians is understanding the cross and that everything you've done wrong in the past and in the future, Jesus knew it. 2,000 years ago, all your sins were in the future. And he died for them. There, and, and, and the curse that was supposed to come, came on Jesus. And so any time the enemy comes at you with a thought that sickness has a right, uh, disease has a right, an accident, uh, someone dies, and he makes you feel guilty, well, this will probably happen because, you know, I had an abortion or because I hurt that person or I killed somebody with my car when I was drunk or I've heard so many stories. You need to know that that is a lie from the enemy. And when you know who you are and what Jesus has done for you, every thought, what's, what extinguishes that thought. Now let's back away from the picture of a shield. Your mind and your heart are armed with truth. And every time the enemy is throwing an arrow, coming arrows at you. Every one of those arrows will be a lie, but he's waiting to see which arrow sticks, which arrow causes fear, which thought hits your head and he can see you just begin to stop and you begin to change all day as you worry. He knows that's the thought that's getting through. And then he'll try to get lots of circumstances and things around you to agree with that thought. Oh, if I could tell you, the Bible says in John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciplined followers indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you become a disciple, that means disciplined in the truths of God's word. The enemy has lost all hope at hurting you, getting you out of peace, getting you out of joy, changing anything in your future from finances to relationships to homes to health. He has no power when you know the truth. The spirit contemporary life means that you live an empowered life, one that connects your day-to-day -day existence with God's supernatural power. As Christians, we're to be the shining light in the world we live in. We're to stand out in our workplace as great employees, bosses, and CEOs. Our relationships should flourish. Christians should and can be the best of the best this sounds good to you, then I encourage you to study your Bible and see what it really says about the Christian life. All of us need to start with our identity rooted in the Word. By practicing generosity, you are not only enriching your own life and putting action to your faith, but you are also changing the lives of others, those who need to hear about the saving grace of Jesus. Father, I pray right now that you would bless them, bless the work of their hands, bless, Father, the areas that they're believing you for. And Father, I pray that in every one of them watching right now would be a heart to advance God's kingdom. And I pray that you'd place it on their heart that together we can go change the world for Jesus. In your name, amen. God bless you. We love you. All over the world, there are people who have not yet heard about the love of Christ, people who desperately need it. We all have an important part to play in sharing this message. God's given us this beautiful life to enjoy, but while you are living it, be very aware that the message you know that Jesus is the answer for the world today. 
reaching people with the gospel is the very heartbeat of this ministry. This is why we work so diligently to make our programs relevant and contemporary, translating hundreds of materials into French, Spanish, Mandarin, Russian, Farsi, and many more. Because of the generosity of partners like you, our programs have been able to reach millions, not only here at home, but also in South America, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. There is still so much work to do. We will not stand by idly because people's eternity lie in the balance. We need to act now. People need to hear about the love of Jesus and his amazing grace today. Together, we will share Jesus in a spirit contemporary way. And together, we will see miracles.